KLIA Loma Linda, 10.50 AM, 106.5 FM, and now 102.3 FM. California Headline News. Sanitary conditions at the LAPD Central Station in downtown are forcing state inspectors to take action. Cal OSHA spokesperson Frank Polizzi says an inspection found lots of health problems. Some things Cal OSHA identified were rats and rodents, fleas, roaches, and even uh, flies and gnats, grasshoppers, and mosquitoes. Cal OSHA is fining LAPD $5,000. At least one officer has been diagnosed with typhoid fever. The log ride at Riverside's Castle Park will remain closed indefinitely, according to the Riverside Press Enterprise. That decision follows an accident that left a woman critically injured. And a major sponsor has pulled its support from the minor league baseball team in Fresno. Raisin Company Sunmade says they're no longer partnering with the AAA baseball team after they showed a video which lumped New York Democratic Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez with the likes of Kim Jong-un and Fidel Castro. The Grizzlies have apologized, calling it a terrible error in judgment. Steve Clawson, California News. They say that if you want to know a person, you should walk a mile in their shoes. Same thing goes for tires. Except Firestone knows it's not just one mile, it's many. With the industry-leading 90-day buy-and-try guarantee, you can test drive our tires for 90 days. Then if you're not fully satisfied with them, we'll refund or replace them for you. Whatever you drive, drive a Firestone. Conditions apply. See FirestoneTire.com for details. Change can happen when you choose it. You can choose treatment and change your addiction to opioids. Medication Assisted Treatment, or MAT, is a proven treatment for opioid addiction that significantly reduces the rate of relapse. Covered by Medi-Cal, Medicare, and many private insurance plans, MAT is even available through primary care doctors. Choose a proven treatment option that's right for you. Learn more at choosemat.org and choose Change California. NBC News Radio, I'm Brian Shook. The White House is considering a plan that would deny asylum to Central American migrants. The new policy would only allow asylum to migrants who arrive without crossing through another country. Currently, any migrant who asks for asylum on U.S. soil has the right to a hearing. Louisiana is the fifth state to pass a fetal heartbeat abortion restriction. Democratic Governor John Bell Edwards signed it into law today. It outlaws abortions after the detection of a fetal heartbeat, which could come as early as the sixth week of pregnancy. Democratic Louisiana State Representative Denise Marcel said that those who say they're pro-life yet approve of the death penalty are being hypocritical. We have the highest rate of turnovers in exonerated people than any other state, which means that we are killing or attempting to kill some innocent people. A longtime member of Congress from Mississippi is dead. Republican Thad Cochran died at the age of 81. Brian Shook, NBC News Radio. Hi everyone, it's Yanitza Munoz from the publications Maxim, FHM, and Sports Illustrated. So being a model, I have to work out a lot. It's tough staying in shape, especially keeping my abs. Until I discovered TC1 Gel. TC1 Gel is a thermogenic gel that you rub on your waist 15 minutes before exercising. Then simply put on the TC1 sweat belt and start your workout. You'll sweat like crazy and feel the burn. It focuses on boosting circulation, increasing perspiration. It activates body heat, reduces muscle fatigue, and burns off more calories. Get your TC1 gel now. Go to tc1gel.com and use the code RADIO30 for 30% off discount on this amazing product. tc1gel.com and get your abs back or just get in shape. Follow their Instagram at tc1gel. Now, here's a new concept. Digital Network Advertising where businesses display your ad inside their building. If a picture is worth a thousand words, your company is going to thrive with digital network advertising. Choose your marketing sites or jump on the DNA system and advertise with all participants. Your business ad or logo is rotated multiple times an hour inside local businesses where people will discover your company. Digital Network Advertising. DNA novel way to be seen and remembered. Digital network advertising with networks in Redlands and Yucaipa. Call in the 909 area 222-9293 for introductory pricing. 
That's 909-222-9293 for Digital Network Advertising. One last time, Digital Network Advertising, 909-222-9293. K-C-A-A. From the NBC News Radio Broadcasting Studios of KCAA, 1050 AM, 102.3 FM, and 106.5 FM, located in beautiful sunny California, which it is today. Thanks for tuning into the Water Zone. And I'm Rob Starr, along with our water wizard, Mr. Chris Davey. How are you tonight, Rob? Good. Warm outside is uh, an understatement. It's really nice. It's a beautiful day out. Uh, yeah, after a, a full week, uh, a weekend, and holiday weekend in the 60s, and uh, now we got 85 degrees outside. It's, it's wonderful. I like it. I love the weather. No, I, more, I, no more rain till yep. tomorrow? <laughs> yep. So I can hear, I can, yep, we got our speakers up We got now. our speakers right working. On. We can okay, hear you. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. We're going to be a real radio show when we grow up. That's right. <laughs> and speaking of that, you did an excellent interview this morning on a uh, radio station all the way back in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Yeah, that was fun. Yeah. They uh, interviewed the interviewers, you and yeah, me. Yeah, that was true. That was a whole lot of fun uh, 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 doing that show with uh, Ken Lanahan. It was awesome. Shanahan. Shanahan. Yeah. <laughs> I told you at the, on the show, I was going, oh, my God, don't, don't let me keep keep saying that Lanahan. Name. Well, that's okay. He was Joe. He was mispronouncing the Toro company too but yeah, that's okay he's a, right. he, but but no 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 he is Ken is a super guy yep uh, like Absolutely. I said I served with him on a, on the uh, standards committee with uh, the NAHP uh, water efficiency group and he is a super guy super builder really understands the green industry and, and uh, I was I was very happy that uh, he asked us to be on on his show we so that was good yeah anything new this week uh, I think from the standpoint of uh, of the uh California Water News, we can get all the latest news from our uh, weekly guest who's just standing by and yeah, waiting to talk to us. Yeah, why don't we go to the and expert? So that's what I'm saying. <laughs> why ask me? We have the expert on the line in the form of the Maven from Maven's Notebook, Chris Austin. I hope you're on the line, Chris. Otherwise, I've just, you know, raised you up on the on the ladder like that, and I hope you're there. And I'd have to change my voice to a higher voice. If to only try. I knew how to make a sound like crickets, it would be great fun. <laughs> I know, but, but I don't. So no, I'm, I'm going to kick it off because I'm going to ask this question, right? I was so, I mean, yeah, you know, I'm a, I'm a daily Maven's Notebook reader. So earlier on the week, I came across the headline as I'm just scanning, you know, just scrolling down the page there that said, Stop the Poop. So oh, yeah, yeah. what is that all about? Oh, TJ. well, gosh, you know, um, Tijuana um, has an issue where, uh, you know, I mean, we always, peep, you look at the map and some there are those out there that think, that rivers only flow south, but sometimes they flow north. I mean, rivers flow downhill, and downhill can be north or south, right? Correct. So at Tijuana, uh, their watershed uh, drains into uh, the lower part of San Diego County. So uh, Tijuana's wastewater treatment plant has, uh, all, has been an issue for a long time, uh, and they get flows that they can't handle and it overflows and their sewage and that sewage crosses the border and comes into the u.s ah illegal poop <laughs> well <laughs> well yeah and here is where you know in the past uh we've actually spent money to go in and build wastewater infrastructure in tijuana um because that's that's really how you solve this kind of problem i mean there. They're, you know, Mexico economically is not on the same par as the United States. And if you want, if they want it clean, right, they've gone in and they built this wastewater infrastructure. But uh, it's not adequate at this point uh, to solve the problem. So they're, they're really looking into this. But if you're down there in San Diego, and especially in Imperial Beach, 
you, you get a lot of situations where um, there isn't, you, you can't swim in the water. So Ew, who would you who would you even think about doing that? Yeah, and this is untreated sewage, right? You're talking about, right. Chris, right? Oh yeah, it's it's ugly. I mean, it's 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 really ugly. Um, and the only really the only solution I that I really think is going to happen is eventually we're going to have to go in there and we're going to have to spend money to clean it up. <laughs> Uh, Can we build a wall? <laughs> That's an old idea. <laughs> no, amazingly, the wall doesn't keep that kind of thing out. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, I mean, a wall for the river. <laughs> well, you know, a dam. Um, I, I was actually out. There's another river that's down there um, called the New River, and it flows from Calexico across the border into, um, you know, into Mexicali. Oh, I'm mm-hmm. sorry, Mexicali and the Calexico. Yes, those two border cities are kind of have their names sort of intertwined, right. and it flows to the Salt Sea, and it's highly polluted water that comes in from Mexico. And I mean, you you can't. You, you what are you going to do? Build a dam? Well, I know the water. I know the water. When I, when I used to work in Mexico at another company, we had factories throughout Mexico. And there was one particular one in Tijuana that if you use the, the bathroom for, I'll use the word in the article, poop, you're not so th- they tell you not to throw the toilet paper into the toilet because the pressure is really bad. There's, they have a trash uh, container next to the toilet, and you throw your used toilet paper into that. That is disgusting. It, it's very disgusting, but that's the way it is down there. Mm. It's 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 really unfortunate. And and you know, I mean, it's it's not that they're choosing to have it this way. It's no. that economically they cannot afford right. to, you know, figure out how to do this. It's a much poorer country. Yeah, um, I, I you know, though, I mean, you know, we joke about it and all the other stuff, but. You know, I really feel sad for people that have to live with those kind of conditions. I mean, of everything in the world that you can't get clean water. I mean, that that's just sort of to me is a basic. It's a basic thing of life, and and, and yet, and, and you're right. It, it it costs millions and millions and millions of dollars to do that. I was reading in the article yeah. that Chris was talking about. It's going to cost a couple hundred billion dollars yeah. just to just to fix that. Yeah, yeah and if. If we want, you know, that, that water's going to flow north into San Diego, no matter what, uh, and, and out to the ocean in our waters, no matter, no matter what. Um, and if we're going to solve that problem, you know, we're going to have to put some money into it. I, I, I mean, that's the only way I, I think, you know, we can jump up and down and we can say fix that problem, but the, I don't think Mexico as a country can afford to. No. Right? No. So, you know, we're going to have to pitch in there. But we also have our own clean water issues sure. here, which was the big, you know, story today. Um, you know, a lot of stories on drinking water yep. and, you know, what's going on in the Central Valley. And, you know, there are a lot of articles pointing out that the drinking water tax isn't necessarily dead yet. There is another uh, bill circulating in the legislature, but um, a lot of focus on what to do about our own drinking water problems um, that we have in the Central Valley. Well, I think um, everybody everybody agrees there's a problem, and I think the question how to raise the money to fix the problem, they're, they're estimating, yeah. what, at $140 million a year? Yeah, but that's out Yeah, of it's, it's really cheap. Uh, you know, I, I I think I actually saw one estimate at 150 million, uh, which sounds like a lot of money. But we're talking about a budget in, in California that you know is in the billions. Yeah, right. like like 220 billion. That's yeah, the California so budget. We're talking about a real small slice, but you know the the problem is when you count on an appropriation from the general fund. That means that the legislature has to approve it every year. And while maybe they will approve it this year, there may be a different climate next year. So it's really hard to um, get a permanent solution going if you don't have if you don't have a permanent solution for funding that. 
And that's really the issue that kind of keeps banding about. Should it be a water tax or come, come from the general fund? You can't use bond funds. We don't have bond funds to cover this. And there's this weird thing about bond funds. They never cover operations and maintenance. And a lot of times the issue isn't necessarily um, putting in all the filters necessarily to give clean water, but that the community cannot afford the prices that it entails to run that treatment to get the clean water to their house because we're talking about really severely disadvantaged communities. Um uh, you know, there's a, there's been a lot of talk. There's been a lot of consolidation, actually, uh, between uh, some of the water agencies um, that exist already in the Central Valley that have some of these severely disadvantaged communities really right next door. And, you know, I mean, it's kind of a sad part of our history, but... Um, you know, back in the 50s and 60s, when there was a, a much different climate um, in terms of race and people of color, a lot of these uh, communities with people of color were just sort of cut out. And even though we have solved this or we have been talking about this issue on the national level, it still really boils down to all divisions that never got, you know, consolidated in a sense. So they're looking, they're, there are a number of communities where they're saying, okay, you have this community with really crappy drinking water next to you. You need to bring them into your system. You need to deliver them clean water. And there, there are a number of those efforts going on um, across the state where it can be done and, and solve the problem economically, uh, they're starting to do it. But uh, there's a bit of an issue where, you know, the state water board, let's say they're not giving them a lot of, uh, they're, they're kind of saying you do it, right? They're not saying you can't. Uh, and which is, you know, but, but people are, there are those that are stepping up to the plate that are taking care of the problem. But again, you know, it becomes an issue, and the biggest issue is how to pay for it. So we will see. The battle wages on. Yeah, that's a true story. Hey, talking about uh, battles, uh, I understand that San Francisco Bay problems faster as regular. Oh, can you hear me now? Sorry. Oh, that's much better. Thank you, sorry. <laughs> Chris, was, Chris was pointing at me. I go, what, what did I do wrong? <laughs> I was sorry. like, how do I say what? Yeah. Huh? He's on the island in Pacific, in the Pacific, no, the no, no mic my at nose, all. My nose was stuffed, and I didn't want to, you know, do it in the microphone, so I turned it off. <laughs> but uh, thank, you, thank you, Chris. And Chris yeah, and, yeah, and, no, and, no problem. And Chris, it's great to hear that, you know, something's happening there, right? I just hope it happens fast for those people, right? The, the, the community, the status of the community, the economic vitality of that community should not be a factor in whether or not it gets done. Uh, it just should be done. This is California. This is 2019. It's America. Yeah, we should get it fixed. Absolutely. Right, and, you know, we need to just, uh, we need to be deliver. We know how to deliver clean water to homes, and we need to be doing that for everybody, especially for the poorest people that uh, pick our food. And right. you know, oh, whether they do or they don't, whether they do whether they pick it or not, that's it's it's a human being. So yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Well, exactly. The first two stories we've talked about kind of center around waste, so maybe we shouldn't, you know, get off that uh, subject yeah. and keep keep going. So, Chris, what about this uh, this uh, state audit that was done for the BCDC, which is the uh, Bay Conservation and oh, Development Commission, right? And you want to oh, yeah. call, call out an audit? Not happy with them, <laughs> are they? Yeah. No, <laughs> not happy at all. They're shooting no, the messenger? No, they say they haven't been um, doing their job. It, it, you know, I, I, and it, it's really tough. Uh, i got to say, anybody, any agency that's out on the front lines uh, that has to deal with sea level rise and all the issues that come with it, it's, it's really tough because there is, um, there's really two camps out there. There's people that are looking at this and saying, uh, we got to prepare and we got to figure out what we're going to do because these waters are coming. And there's the other side that's like, oh, no, no way. 
it's not going to happen. And the BCDC has been one of those agencies that has been, you know, sort of was intended to uh, tell people no, and they don't feel they've uh, told people no enough. Uh, so uh, it's, it's not, you know, sea level rise, it's not easy. Uh, the people in the city of Del Mar, uh, you know, the Coastal Commission, the California Coastal Commission has mandated that as all the cities that are along the coast update their general plans, they must start uh, thinking about accommodating for sea level rise. And the city of Del Mar, which is a very nice, lovely community down in San Diego, um, their city council started talking about uh, the idea of managed retreat, and the homeowners went ballistic, and they would not allow managed retreat, retreat meaning we understand the seas are coming, we're going to start pulling back from the coast. Um, I, I guess they want what what we would refer to as armoring of the coast, meaning more sea level, more sea walls, more things to defend against sea level rise. But if the seas are rising, anything you put up there to prevent that is only a matter of time. <laughs> it's like, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, this, the whole issue of sea level rise, it, it's, pretty, it's pretty gnarly. How much does, so, anybody, does anybody know... How much land we use every year? How much shrinkage of the property in well, California? Yeah, in, in California, so far it hasn't been it hasn't been too bad. Um, and sea level has not risen, you know, a whole lot at the Golden Gate. But the you know all the science is saying that it's coming. And when we have these. Uh, what they call the king tide, which are when the moon lines up with the earth and the the tides come in from the coast and they're the highest, we're getting, you know, flooding in Marin County. And certain, there's a road up there, a highway, um, Highway 37, I believe it is, that goes into Napa and Petaluma. And it got, it, it got swamped, it got flooded. And they are trying to figure out what to do with that road, and they're considering actually raising it, raising it up on a bridge to take it up off land because, the, you know, the the seas are rising. Um, it, there's there's really no doubt about that. And you know, the problem is if we don't do anything about it now, I mean. It's too late to move your wastewater treatment plant at the coast when the the t- high tide is, you know, cresting water over your wall. Right. Uh, you know, it takes a long time to reconfigure your infrastructure and to build that new wastewater plant, and you just can't wait for the disaster to happen. You know, you, you people have to start moving now, and it, it, it's... The whole issue of sea level rise, I think, is really difficult. Yeah, it is, especially in California, right? I mean, there's such a varied coastline here, right? Geologically and geographically, California is at an advantage on a lot of its coastline because it's it, it's so rugged, right? The coastal range just plunges into the Pacific, and and its uh, uh, sea level ri- rise affects that area much less than it does bay and delta areas um, where most of the infrastructure is placed, right, and people are. so. Um. Well, yeah, I mean, we're, we're all set to, everything drains downhill to the coast and into the coast. That's where we have our wastewater treatment plants that, you know, clean up our, our water and stick it out into the sea. Um, and, if, I mean, this is going to be a, a major reconfiguration of our coast that's coming. And it's hard, I think, for people to wrap their head around it. When you hear, you know, sea level rise by one foot or two foot, I think some people can't comprehend that. What does that mean? When you go out to the beach, is, you know, the waves, are, are they going to lap one foot or two foot farther up the beach? You know, but it, it's much more than that. <laughs> it's, true. it's much more than that. We're talking, you know, one feet over the entire ocean. Um, it's not about, you know, creeping up on the sands. It's much more than that. And it's really hard for people 
uh, to wrap their heads around. I, I get it. I get it. Um, but it's coming. Um, there's no doubt. I think, you know, they're, the science is saying, and we have uh, ice, you know, glaciers melting and ice shelf dropping into the ocean in Antarctica. Um, they say that, you know, these mid-latitudes have had some, uh, they haven't seen the sea level rise because when the world spins, it kind of bulges a little bit. Uh, actually, I remember this from, like, my GIS class I took years ago in college. It bulges a little bit around the middle. Oh, just like me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's spinning around, and, and those waters <laughs> sort of pull out. It's not it's not a even spin, you know, in a sense. It doesn't affect the world uh, completely. And so, you know, we're going to we're gonna get the impact of this. I mean, it's... It, it's sea level rise and climate change. It's, it's you know it's it's happening. It's happening. It is. Well, we gotta we gotta give our uh, give a little break here and give a chance for our wonderful sponsors to say a couple words. Chris, we love you as usual. You give us the best water news in California that anybody can get. Anybody who listens to uh, to us should check her. Uh, uh, website out. It's mavensnotebook.com. You can become a sponsor of that. You can also get uh, daily updates and everything you ever want to know about it. It's mavensnotebook.com. Chris, thanks a lot, and uh, we appreciate you being on our show again. Have a great okay. week, Chris. Good evening, guys. All right. Take care. Okay, everybody stand by. We're going to take a quick little break, and uh, we'll be back in the second half. We've got an excellent guest, a special guest that I'm very excited about, and uh, we'll be back in just a moment. Stay with us, folks. If you knew there was a pipe cement that works better than the one you're currently using, is better for you and the environment, and costs the same or less, would you buy it? Oh, well, no-brainer, right? Weldon, the trusted leader in solvent cements for over 60 years, is pleased to introduce a new line of solvent cements that does all that. Introducing the Eco-Series line of solvent cements for PVC piping systems. Not only does it work great and set fast, it also has 30% lower solvent emissions and less smelly fume, a better workplace environment when you're installing pipes. But don't just take our word for it. EcoSeries products are the only solvent cements that are Green Seal certified for environmental innovation for effective performance, improved working conditions, and for use with potable water. Now available in a medium-bodied fast-setting blue formula, 905 Eco, and a regular-bodied fast-setting clear formula, 900 Eco. Pick up a can today from your local distributor and see, smell, and feel the difference, just like Joe Sweat, president of Sunrise Irrigation, did. He said, after using Weldon's 905 Eco, we immediately noticed the application was smooth and there was noticeably less odor than other blue solvent cements on the market. The guys love it. To learn more about Eco solvent cements from Weldon, visit the website at www.weldon.com or call the Technical Service Hotline at 877-477-8327. That's 877-477-8327. Time to take a water break and talk some water. Irrigation. such a refreshing topic. As more and more markets face water restrictions, your customers may be hungry or, should I say, thirsty for water saving products. For new installations, add options like drip irrigation, controllers that respond to weather data, pressure regulating heads, or heads with check valves. They all provide easy ways to differentiate your bids and win more jobs. Or for an extra stream of revenue, offer existing customers upgrades like high efficiency nozzles, rotary nozzles, or Wi-Fi based controllers. Because when you help your customers save water, you make a world of difference for the earth and your bottom line at the same time. We'll drink to that. Half of the uh, Water Zone show we appreciate it with Rob and Chris, and uh, we're having a good day. But uh, this to me is something special coming up. Our guest, I was trying to get him on for a long time, and yeah. I've known him for a long time. But this guy is awesome. Um, he's to me, he's one of the the most formidable irrigation design experts in the country, and uh, I've worked. 
and some committees with him and have been to lots of events with him. And, and, and to me, I'm very humbled and honored that he's on our show. A gentleman named Brian Van Casey, who's the uh, founder of Irrigation Consulting uh, in Massachusetts, and he formed that in 1992. He graduated from Montana, Montana State University, Bozeman, with a degree in agriculture, irrigation engineering. He's received God knows I don't know how many prestigious accolades in his, in his illustrious career. He's got the EPA Water Sense Irrigation Partner of the Year, a Roy Williams Memorial Award from the American Society of Irrigation Consultants, just just to name a couple. He's the author of numerous books and trade industry articles, and uh, I can go on and on for an hour just saying what this guy's done, but uh, I really want to welcome, Chris and I are very, very humbled that you're on the show. Brian, welcome to the Water Zone. Thank you, Rob. Good to talk to you. How you been? I've been busy. <laughs> that's that's good. Hey, for our listeners, because we know you, uh, maybe you can tell uh, tell them uh, what made you choose your current career path, and 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 how did you get started? How did you, you start your business? Well, I uh, always wanted to be an engineer, and I was going to be a mechanical engineer. I actually uh, wanted to design bulldozers for Caterpillar. Oh. I'd always always wanted to. Dr- to do both bulldozers, and uh, when I was early in high school, I found out that if I became a mechanical engineer, I'd be sitting behind a desk every day, mm. and uh, I didn't quite like that idea, so I had a friend of mine mention to me agricultural engineering, and I looked into that and found out that uh, I'd be able to be an engineer and spend a lot of time outside, and so I looked at that, and that's what I became, and I spend about four days a week in the field instead of five days a week at a desk, so it works uh, really well for me. Wow. And I started irrigation consulting uh, with a friend of mine way back in uh, 92. Uh, just I had done irrigation distribution for a while and had done a lot of design work in there, and especially in the East, there weren't any irrigation consultants then, so the first few years were a struggle, but uh, we finally got it going, and uh, we have been... And now you're turning business away. You're so busy. Still doing it. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, Brian, this is Chris. Welcome to the show. Uh, first of all, as a uh, as a long term participant in uh, the irrigation industry, starting off on the business end of a shovel myself, I've grown up in the industry, reading uh, books from you, reading the articles in magazines of all different variations and kinds, and and uh, taking uh, taking classes where in the credits your name consistently appears. So, <laughs> and you took copious notes too. Yes, and I I, I did take copious notes. So uh, maybe for our listeners, like like uh, a lot of them are are in the water business already. Some in irrigation, some are not. So uh, can you kind of give us a general overview, thirty thousand foot view, if you will, of um, what's the benefits of an irrigation system in general? Well, I, I think most people like them because they're automated. So they, they come on and off uh, all by themselves with a timer or hopefully something smarter than that. Uh, that's both a benefit and a curse uh, because some people don't change them very often from a <laughs> scheduling standpoint. But So you have the ease of watering your lawn automatically. But really the benefit of an irrigation system is it ha- allows you to have a healthy landscape and a healthy landscape is produces more oxygen, is more resistant to disease, uh, more resistant to pests, uh, and produces more environmental uh, benefits than an unhealthy lawn or an unhealthy landscape. So um, irrigation is probably best for that, and the automation is just a side benefit to it. Do you think the people really believe it's set and forget for all these controllers and such? Because, I mean, there's been lots of uh, uh, testing by water agencies around the country, and we've been to some of them that where they, they installed the controllers. They did an audit first. They installed the controllers. They made sure the system was operating great. And a year later, they come back and say, well, all these smart controllers don't work. And, you know, one of the first questions I ask from, from a manufacturing perspective is, well, did you go back and check the system? Did you see if something went wrong? Did they have broken pipes? Was they had tilted uh, uh, heads? Uh, did somebody change the program in the controller? You know, simple things like that. And they go, no, we didn't go back and check. We just read the water meters. And, right. you know, and, that, and that's the scary thing. It gives, it gives the controller people a bad name. And it's not, 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 you know, all in general, everybody who participated in that was, was pretty bad. But do you think people 
are there for the change? You think they're 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 comfortable? Because I t- to me, you know, moving forward, I I believe everything is down the road is going to be connected to the Internet of Things. But you know, can I believe that uh, connected products will help sus- you know drive sustainability in the future? But to me, people have to have confidence. In, in, in what they're in, in, in the process of how that's going to work, and they have to be able to be able to change, and that's hard for people I think to do. Correct. Well, one of the issues with irrigation, and you probably hear me say this way too much tonight, but ge- irrigation is very geographic in terms of a how it's respected, used, and actually how it's installed. So up here in the Northeast, we don't get a lot of irrigation respect, and therefore. Um, we get water bands very quickly and banned irrigation systems because it is considered supplemental. Where in Southern California, Arizona, the Southwest, it's it, it's considered necessary, so it gets treated with a lot more respect. So that's one problem. I do agree that certainly in the places where it's not necessary, the set it and forget it mentality is is very prevalent, where people just set it for one schedule and leave it there all year. And as you said. You can put on a smart controller, but putting on a smart controller doesn't make the basic irrigation system smart. It just makes the controller smart. So you still, a bad irrigation system is still a bad irrigation system, even with a smart controller. And you have to check it to make sure it does all the things you it's supposed to, as well as the connect, the nice thing about the new connected systems that are Internet-based is people have a tendency to to look at them more because they it's easy for them to go out and look at it. Yep. When your when your controller is in your garage behind a shelf with a bunch of boxes on it, you're not gonna go out and change it very often because you don't see it. No, well, that's that's true. I, I remember a couple of years back on <clears throat> one of our controllers, I was in Florida with one of our sales guys they asked me to come out and do some technical things and and we went to one one gentleman's house and he was actually he was an attorney. He he was based based out of New York but he had an office and and another home in Florida. And every morning he told us, and, and we went to his yard, and he has a chair sitting by his smart controller. And he says he goes out there every ni- every morning to have his cup of coffee and look at the controller to see what it did the night before. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and, he was, he, and that was his routine every day. <laughs> Must be retired. Yeah. yeah. No, he wasn't. He was still working. He was a patent attorney, but that's what he did every day. He went out yeah. and looked at it, and then he called him. How come it only did 14 minutes today instead of uh, 16 or you know things like that? I mean, he, he was really curious about all of that. Very pretty- well, and that's one of the issues with smart controllers is, you know, people are used to seeing an irrigation system go on at the same time every right. day for the same period of time with the same zones. And the smart controller is not going to do that. Right. It's going to do the what's the most efficient way to irrigate and the amount of water you need in it. And a lot of people don't understand it, so then they think it's not working because it didn't water at, at 8 p.m. on Saturday night. Sure. Oh, but you, also, you also have a bunch of people who uh, they get their bill for the first or a couple of months after a smart controller goes in and say, hey, this thing didn't save me money. It's, it's, it's running more. And that's because they didn't bro- water properly and water enough that they needed to do in the first place. But those, right, are, those are scary things when they, they come back at you. And that was the problem with the first few major studies on smart controllers is a lot of people were underwatering right. and were not giving the landscape which it needed. And that's fine but to, under, to deficit irrigate, but you have to know you're deficit irrigating. Sure, right. yep. Well, Brian, we got a ton more questions for you, but uh, let's go back to uh, just a little bit to the beginning, and maybe we can find out from you a little bit about Irrigation Consulting, Inc. I mean, I'm familiar with the company. Uh, I know uh, Jeff Bowman, for example. I just traveled with him to uh, to Germany in March. Uh, but give us a little background about uh, about your company and, and what services you provide and offer. And Okay, and yeah, Jeff's been with me 22 years, so... Uh not quite the whole time, but pretty close. We got him right out of college. But uh, we do uh, high-end residential. I don't think we've done a house that's under probably $10 million. But um, we do a lot of commercial. We do uh, a really lot of university work. We probably worked in over 70 colleges and universities. Uh, Do a lot of Harvard work and Duke work and MIT and that sort of thing. So we do a lot of universities. We do a lot of U.S. Embassy work, actually, overseas. We do a lot of schools, um, parks, and then we do um, quite a bit of golf also. So we're one of the larger golf irrigation consultants in the country. 
Yeah. Are, are most of these jobs uh, new, or are they almost all new, or do you do some retrofit work also? Well, on the golf, it's mostly retrofit because we're on the east. So we have a lot of older golf courses that have to be redone. On the commercial, it's, it's mostly new, although um, we are doing quite a, we do quite a bit of evaluation of existing commercial systems also uh, recommend how they might be able to be enhanced without being replaced. Uh, so it depends on the market, golf versus commercial, basically on what we do. do you to you, sorry. Uh, no, <laughs> Chris. Hey, to uh, uh, to you, Brian. So, which which of those, um, you know, new or retrofit kind of businesses, golf or the commercial? What, which one of those, or a combination of them, do you find most rewarding to you? Well, it depends. Um, I like the weird stuff. I've been doing this a long time, so. Uh, we like stuff that's different because it's more challenging, you know. Uh, so we have to think about what we're doing and uh, make sure we're doing something new and exciting or looking at the project differently than others might look at it. And a lot of that these days is stormwater and rainwater harvesting type um, things. Or when we did the National Mall, which is a commercial site, we put a golf course system on it because we felt that was the best way to irrigate the mall, and uh, that threw a lot of people off, but it worked uh, quite well thinking outside the box with mm -hmm. that, because one of the problems you have with golf versus commercial is the manufacturers don't necessarily like you to put golf products on non-golf courses, and the commercial guys don't like you to put uh, golf products on commercial sites, so it gets a little interesting in that respect, but we like to think outside the box, so we like projects that are different and challenging. Um, to and make you, us think a little more. And you have to, you guys have to be pretty up to all the different state regulations and county and local things when you're working on a project, correct? I mean, that's, you got to know yeah, what's, and, what, what they want. Especially on the rainwater side, there's a lot of new uh, codes, um, especially the green codes that are dictating what you do on the rainwater and the stormwater side that you have to be very familiar with. Yep. So um, when, when you, Client comes to you and say, and it doesn't matter which you know, I'll let you choose which which part of the industry, whether it's the high end homes or the golf courses or commercial. <clears throat> what are some of the most important questions that you would, when you sit down with them and, and, and they're trying to tell you what they want? I'm sure you have in your mind or on paper. Here's here's my here's my checklist, and, and the customer's got to answer all these things. What what's important to you that they need to tell you? Yeah, so right at the beginning of the process, right. you mean, Rob? Right. 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 Yeah. So one of the big things for us is what's your maintenance regime going to be? Are you um, going to maintain this in-house? Are you contracting it out? Uh, who's going to take care of the irrigation system? Because we might treat things a little differently depending on that. On golf, it's pretty straightforward because you've, you've got a maintenance staff that's doing that. But on the golf side, the big question is where are we going to get the water? Because um, it's a lot of water. On the commercial side, the water's a little more straightforward. Most of it still out here, at least, is potable, although uh, we, we do try to do a lot of groundwater also. But our groundwater laws in the east are getting a little more strict in terms of who can just throw a well in the ground and, and get water. So we always want to look at the water source. We want to look at um, the maintenance. We want to look at if it's overstructure. Um, is it at grade? Is it all on? You know, soil, or is it all on concrete, or is it on concrete with three inches of soil? So depths of uh, are good. And then the other question we ask, especially on our institutional clients, is whether or not they allow drip. Uh, we have a lot of institutional clients, uh, colleges, universities, hospitals, that from a maintenance standpoint are not fond of drip. So we always have to ask that question of whether we're allowed to do drip. And then also now, um, whether or not they know what a smart controller is, and if they want one, we've, we've had several places where, from a sustainability standpoint, we put in a smart controller because we want to get our lead points. And then two weeks after it's in and the maintenance guys have gotten a hold of it, they take it out and start using, put in a conventional controller or switch it from being a smart controller to a conventional controller. So those are newer questions you have to start asking that we never had asked before. 
Okay. Well, apart from the water availability issue, the maintenance issues that you've already talked about, are there any are there any common themes that you've seen over your experience and over the years that that come up? You know, like each and every time with each design, some common issues, if you will, that that you face when it uh, 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 with each project. Well, in terms of issues, you know, nobody ever seems to be able to get a sleeve in the right place, um, <laughs> or all of the men on the job. Which is, we just had that last week. They missed the sleeve, and it, you know. They don't want to go back and put it in because all the concrete's down or the paving's down. So that's uh, one of the big issues. Um, depending on where you are, um, contractor quality is an issue. Uh, we have contractors that are very good, and we have contractors that are not very good. And depending on the project uh, and the owner, we may get the not very good one or we may get the really good one. And it depends on whether you have to be licensed. One thing I do like about irrigation licensing is you know that the contractor knows how to do it correctly because he had to pass a test that basically tested him on whether he knows how to do it correctly. So uh, I like licensing or certifications on my contractors, but not a lot of states require that. I mean, there's only seven out of yeah. the 50 that actually do that. I, I love Texas for doing that. <laughs> Excuse me? I love Texas for making them... Uh, you know, certified. Yeah, it's much e it's much easier. I had I had a guy. Uh, I, I guess I'll call him a mow and blow instead of a landscaper. That might be the proper thing. And I had a valve. My wife called me and said, "Hey, the, the valve's leaking." So she called me at work. I go, "What do you want me to do?" So I said, "Call call the guy." So she calls the guy and he comes over and, and he tells her, oh, "It's the, the valve's bad, and it's going to cost you know hundred and something dollars to change it out." <clears throat> so I called him back on the phone, and I said, well, look, there's only a couple things that can go wrong with the with the valve. It could either be cracked, the the uh, diaphragm could there be something underneath, a piece of dirt or something that's keeping it from closing or solen or, you know. And so he gives me this whole speech and blah, 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 blah. He says, okay, I'll check all this out. So he, he does does it, so he gives the bill to my wife that day, and two days later she calls me at work. She says, hey, the valve's leaking. <laughs> And so I said, well, you call me, how come, you know, you, you, you can call me and yell at me. Why don't you call the guy <laughs> and yell at him, you know? So she calls him back up and goes through this and that. So I come home, and I go out and measure this stuff. I put my DVM, and I found it's a solenoid's a problem. We kept the thing open, and, and but I asked him, did you check it? He obviously didn't know how to use a DVM or even know what to look for. And that's why, that's why I prefer people that have training, especially through the IA, uh, an organization like that, and and because they really teach you well, and 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 you really you get what you pay for in that industry. I mean, anybody can buy a lawnmower and say I'm going to cut grass, and that's it. But then when they have to install things, they don't know. They don't match the the heads. They don't match the nozzles. They don't do any of that stuff, and it's just just a slop job. But right. go go back to to this. You I know you participated on the SWAT executive team for the IA as its chairman, and and um, we all know what the term <coughs> excuse me the word SWAT means. But maybe uh, we'd like to have you tell our, our listeners what that stands for and, and what was the purpose of that and where, where is it today? So SWAT stands for Smart Water Application Technologies. It sort of started in 2001 unofficially with a meeting and then of 10 water purveyors and 10 manufacturers and then in 2002 it became more formal and, and it really had, when it was set up, two missions. Uh, one was to promote new irrigation technologies that save water, and the other mission was to um, develop testing protocols so that water purveyors knew that if a manufacturer said, this is going to save 20% of your water, we could actually test it to see if uh, it saves 20% of your water. Mm -hmm. the water purveyors, especially Southern Nevada Water Authority, were very concerned that there was all these new controllers on the market and there were all these claims, but nobody was testing them on a on the same basis to see what they were doing. So that's where it initially started. Today, it does basically the same thing. The promotion side has gotten very uh, homeowner oriented. Uh, on our website, we have a homeowner's guide to irrigation, and we also just put up a guide to uh, app based or internet based controllers. Uh, there's over a hundred of those on the market at the moment, and um, many of them are really good at technology and very bad at irrigation scheduling. Yep. So uh, there's a on the website for SWAT, we have a, a whole spreadsheet that tells you the different kinds and the features and what they do and what they do. So that's on the promotion side. On the technical side, 
we are still writing protocols for testing. Most of our protocols now we then turn in, try to turn into standards, but we have protocols for smart controllers, soil moisture sensors, rain sensors, pressure regulating, um, sprinklers. We are just about done with a flow sensor protocol. Uh, we've been working on that for a few years. And our next uh, protocol that we'll be going to is pressure regulating valves, so developing a test for checking that those do what they're supposed to do. Yeah, I, I, I think, personally, I think that's, that's so important. I, I sit on a, a committee with uh, Brent Meekham, who I know you know very well, uh, mm-hmm. in, in the NAHB uh, water efficiency task team. And, you know, I got into discussion with some people about the, the EPA-approved weather-based controllers. They, were, they wanted to give points for a manufacturer who says they're they're a weather-based controller, but was but but they but they did not get EPA certification, and I'm saying, well, anybody can say that it doesn't mean it works, you know, and uh, so they agreed with that. But but in your opinion, some EPA-approved weather-based controllers collect their ET data, um, you know, from on-site equipment, remotely from weather stations, and from the internet. But there's also a group of of those that I noticed when I went through the list the other day that some of the EPA listed controllers utilize projected weather for- forecasts. How do you how do you Correct. feel about th- how do you feel about that versus the uh, and the accuracy to actual weather data? In your opinion? Well, I, I'm a big fan of the on some sort of on-site sensor to make it more local. Um, However, I would say that these weather apps are getting really, really good. Mm-hmm. So I think those are going to become more accurate uh, in the future pretty quickly. Um, so I'm a fan of the on-site, uh, something that's at least looking at temperature and humidity uh, and rain and adjusting accordingly. But I'm not sure we're too far off for having more of this forecasted weather. We had a, um, when we were doing the standard for uh, for ET um, landscape use, we had a big discussion about whether we should think about forecasting um, control uh, weather type sensors also. And we decided not to at that time. Hmm. You know, one of the things I always challenge my people at our company um, and others, um, they they like to use historical data as a backup. And I, I kind of call it hysterical data, only for the sense that I really don't care what it was 100 years ago or 50 years ago or 20 years ago or two years or three years ago. Uh, to me, I'd rather see, because yeah. there's, there's a lot of things, I mean, I'd rather see something with a 10-day or a 20-day rolling average so it goes back to that. Because, one, it adds cost to manufacturing to buy the, the memory devices, to chips to stick in the thing. And plus, you pay a service who gives you all that data all the time and updates it. And and. I, uh, you know, if, if you can do something within the 10 to 20 day rolling average, I think that's well enough and, and it helps to reduce the cost because most homeowners today, especially when you go to the big box stores, they want to, they want a smart controller that does everything and internet and all that for under a hundred bucks. That's what they're looking for. And in the better homes and things that you do for the $10 million homes and up, you know, people want a little bit more sophistication in their thing. They want more, I, I call it between, do you want accuracy or, uh, you know, uh, I forget the, the term I used to use, adequacy. So do you want accuracy or adequacy in a controller? And you pay the difference in those two things. But where do you think that's leading? Do you think the $100 controller is where the the normal retrofit market or the brand new housing market should be? And then for the better, the more expensive homes and the more commercial going to something that's more accurate versus adequate? Well, I think you're, you're, the $100 or inexpensive controller is, is not going to be that popular in the future unless it gets less expensive. Of course, volume drives the price down. Right. Because um, I think regulation is going to have a lot to do with what controller you're going to put on your your residence. I mean, even if you look at the, the you know the the green code for for residential building, that, which water sense for homes, which is totally changing at the moment, but the green code that all the builders are working on collaboratively, um, that's going to require a certain level of intelligence in that controller that you're not going to get in an inexpensive controller. Right. 
All right. Hey, Brian, Chris, again, I just I just like to I'd like to follow up on a, uh, something I was trying leading on a little bit earlier. But I know you guys, your your business is working on some pretty high profile sort of um, well-known projects like the National Mall in Washington, D.C., Central Park in New York. Is uh, is there a chance you can tell us a little bit about those uh, those projects? Sure. The. Um the, the mall project, which has just finished up in the fall, um, was very interesting in that uh, we it was all potable water originally, and we weren't real fond of doing potable water for that much lawn. So uh, we collect about a million square feet of storm water, and not rainwater, storm water, uh, and we have four 250,000-gallon tanks that are buried under the mall, basically, Two of them are under the walkways, and two of them are actually in the in the the lawn. Um, we pump out of one. We transfer water to the other uh, from the other three to the one to pump out of. We have a underground pump station uh, that is in a very large vault, and that pump station uh, comes out of the cistern. We filter and disinfect. The water before we spray it because we have uh, in Washington D.C. If you spray stormwater in the ear, it needs to be disinfected. We disinfect it, and we have a potable water backup. And one of the neat things we did with the potable water backup is we put a flow meter on the potable water backup and a flow meter on the pump station, and then we put actuator valves so that the city water system never puts more water into the cistern than we're using at the pump station. The two flow meters are synced up. So we were real concerned about, you know, how much potable water do we leave in the cistern and leave the room for the rain and all that. And what we basically came up with is, well, let's not put any more water in there than, than we're using. It's a, as I said before, a commercial system. It has, but it has a golf course irrigation sprinklers on it. The National Park Service uh, wanted to minimize the number of sprinklers uh, there's so much activity on the mall and some activity not friendly to irrigation, which was the downfall of their last system, which was tent right. stakes, um, that we, the less, sprink, less sprinklers we have, the less chance to damage them. So the golf sprinklers were the best bet. The mall is very historic, uh, so the dimensions never changed. It was a simple 180 feet wide the whole way down, so it worked for golf real well. And it has a very high-end, smart, uh, control system on it using two-wire technology as opposed to conventional uh, technology. So that one was interesting and uh, kept us busy for about five years. And then um, we also do uh, an awful lot of work with Central Park. And the interesting thing about Central Park is even though there's separate irrigation systems, our water supply is the same water supply for the whole 864 acres. The piping system, irrigation mainline piping system and water supply system is all tied together. So uh, whenever you do anything on there, it, it kind of you have to look at the whole park uh, as a whole. So we do a lot of hydraulic analysis. Oh, absolutely. At the park. Well, as we're coming up to the uh, 7 o'clock news here for NBC, I just got a burning question. So what's your current vision of where irrigation industry is going? Well, again, I think it's geographic. I think in the West, it's it's going well. I think you're going to get more pressure to use smarter technologies. Um, certainly, in California, Energy Commission is looking at that with requiring pressure regulating sprinklers uh, in the near future, smart controllers in the near future on all systems. But as you come further east or places where there's more rain, I think you're going to see more pressure put on the irrigation industry uh, and more restrictions. Uh, they don't seem to encompass or in, embrace the technology as they, because it's just easier to just say you can't do it or you only can do it one day a week, which makes no sense or that sort of thing. So I think it's very geographic. In some places it's going to be very good. In some places it's not going to be a lot of fun. Depends on where you are then. Yeah. yeah. Hey, Brian, we, we certainly, I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm in awe when I talk to you and listen to you talk, so you're an awesome guy. And uh, where can they reach uh, your company if, they, if we have some listeners that want to get the best in the business? 
Well, <laughs> you can look at our website, which is www.irrigationconsulting.com. Great. Hey, we thank you very much uh, on behalf of the Water Zone. We do appreciate that, and uh, we hope to see you shortly, and uh, hope everything's going well with you. And, uh, again, thanks for, thanks for being on our show. We appreciate it. Great. Thanks, Chris and Rob. I really appreciate it. Good. Have, uh, a, have a great day. Yep. And to our listeners, the most important thing you got to do this week is think, think blue. blue. Good night, everybody. We'll talk to you next week. Have a good week. CAA Loma Linda, 1050 AM, 106.5 FM, and now 102.3 FM.